today in nerd history. People are bad. I'm sorry, but they are spiteful and vindictive and petty, and they will do things just to make other people mad. And video game developers, I know you think they're better than us. I know you think that they're golden angels up on high, but no, my friend, they're just as petty as we are. And here are five acts of petty spite going on behind video games. Number one, an NBA Jam programmer rigged the game against the Bulls. Michael Jordan, you know, the guy, the sports guy, he was pretty famous in his day. You might say that he was the biggest in his basketball industry. His scoring was unrivaled, his intensity unmatched, and he helped lead the Chicago Bulls to the NBA championships six times in the 1990s. Six! I haven't done anything six times. What am I doing here? Anyway, let's talk about video games more. It's possible he could have done even more had he not taken a break to play baseball for real and play basketball against the Monstars for fake real. But Jordan's era of basketball dominance wasn't without flaw. In the late 80s, the Detroit Pistons steamrolled the Bulls in the playoffs to take home two titles. They did this by running the Jordan rules, playing extra hard and hitting the guy as much as they could without getting suspended. Age and injury derailed the Pistons' winning streak and let the Bulls rise up, but the stage was set for some serious video game drama. A few years into the year of our Lord Jordan, the NBA Jam series were starting to light up arcades with intense but cartoonish action. Jordan doesn't actually appear in the game due to some licensing hangups, but the Bulls and Pistons were both there. And by 1993, the Pistons' victories were a memory for most people, but not for Michigan native developer Mike Termel. So quietly, Termel turned the tides for the digital version of the Pistons by decreasing the likelihood that the Bulls would score against his home team. The Pistons-Bulls rivalry is just like a distant footnote in actual basketball history, but thanks to this one developer, it'll live on forever in NBA Jam. Number two, Call of Duty was partly created to get revenge on EA. Call of Duty Modern Warfare is over 10 years old now. Yeah, you might've been tricked by the modern part, but this game came out a literal decade ago. The series has finally returned to the World War II settings, but there are probably plenty of players who don't remember a time when it was set in any other than the present. Back in the day, it seemed like every single first-person shooter was another Normandy beach-storming World War II shooter. And the one to kick off the trend was Medal of Honor, which was created in part by director Steven Spielberg during his Saving Private Ryan Band of Brothers era. 2002's Medal of Honor Allied Assault was a huge success for the series, met with industry-wide praise. It did so well, in fact, that Electronic Arts wanted to absorb the independent developer, 2015 Inc., into its corporate fold. According to developer Vince Zampella, this aggressive strategy burned the goodwill of tons of employees at 2015, and some banded together to leave and form a completely new company called Infinity Ward. And so, in 2003, Call of Duty was born and would proceed to eat Medal of Honor's lunch for years to come. Zampella is now the CEO of Respawn, the developer of the Titanfall series. Maybe you heard of it? And in the lead up to Titanfall 2's release, Zampella told IGN that the original Call of Duty was a little bit of a f you to EA over at Strong Army. Call of Duty might not have been entirely made out of spite, but still, telling a publisher to take a hike and then releasing a franchise killing competitor? Pretty awesome act of pettiness. Number three, Billy Joel got into video games to stick it to a TV reviewer. Only a few short years after the World War II games gold rush, the new moneymaker in the video game industry was plastic instruments and slapping the word hero onto any person who could play three buttons roughly in time with pre-recorded music. Pretty cool, huh? Fun at parties. But as wildly pervasive as Guitar Hero and Garage Band games were, licensing the music was occasionally a pain, to the point where master of fake authenticity Kid Rock would bemoan how inauthentic it is to press colored buttons to his so-called music. But in 2010, there was a throwaway joke in an episode of The Office, referencing playing Billy Joel songs in Rock Band. We can watch a movie and play Rock Band. Billy Joel Rock Band. When in fact, at that point, none of the Piano Man's music had been licensed to appear in the popular party game. So that week's Entertainment Weekly recap made mention of the joke, primarily to shit on the idea of Billy Joel being popular enough to appear in Rock Band. Billy Joel, however, read this recap and had his own joke to play. That's what I call a Billy Joel joke. He probably doesn't call it that because it's a stupid thing to say. Something an idiot man would tell a camera. He had his people get in touch with harmonics, and a short time later, his music was playable in Rock Band. As the saying goes, you come at the Joel, you best not miss. Do people say that? I don't think they do. 
Number four, one of the worst games of all time was a product of Warner Brothers sabotage. Superman 64 is infamously bad, and for as atrocious as it might be to look at it or play it, the story behind it is even wilder. According to Titus Software founder Eric Kane, the game was hampered at every step by actively vindictive DC Comics licensing teams who wanted the game to be terrible. I mean, the game would have been really good, says Eric. It totally would have been awesome. Likely story, but still, here's what happened. As the story goes, the devs signed the deal to make the game with one team and were almost immediately sent off to a different group of DC execs who were wholly uncooperative. The original game concept would have featured an open world where players could fly around the city as they choose, but the game was repeatedly bogged down with unreasonable requests that fundamentally broke development, including a request to turn the game into a SimCity clone about taking care of Metropolis. Kine concluded that the licensing team felt like they weren't getting as much money from Titus Software and Warner Brothers as they would from a big publisher like EA. The destructive thing here wasn't kryptonite, but cold hard cash. And it wasn't something they wanted, instead of having- I, I'm beginning to think this metaphor isn't very good. The point is, they deliberately obstructed development and made it hell. The game prominently features flying through rings as a main mode of gameplay. And apparently this was an executive order from on high, since DC didn't feel Superman should spend most of his time fighting enemies. I feel bad for the team at Titus, but at the same time, the resulting game is so miraculously unparalleled in its badness that it kind of had to exist, right? Number five, Mortal Kombat mocks would-be censors with new finishers. Mortal Kombat's draw has always been, yes, say it with me, the fatalities. The goofy yet savage violence really set the games apart from the pack in the early 90s, even if it was just a goofy gimmick. But looking at how totally gruesome and brutal the fatalities are in current games, it's hard to imagine anyone was ever mad at the tiny bit of sprite-based spine ripping in the originals. But in the 90s, Mortal Kombat was a lightning rod for controversy, even leading to the creation of the ESRB. Did you know that? Now you do. Senator Joe Lieberman thought the games represented a greater societal rot, so the industry started self-regulating so that the government wouldn't censor them itself. Was this an overreaction? Yes. Was it hilarious in retrospect? Super yes. And developer Midway thought so too. When Mortal Kombat 2 launched in 1993, the game included a slew of new finishers to respond to the controversy. But instead of slicing your opponent in half or pulling their skulls out of their butts, there were babalities to literally transform your opponents into crying infants, and friendships where the characters would offer up a completely innocent gesture to their enemies. And just like that, the violent video game about punching buckets of blood out of your opponent's face was family friendly. And Senator Joe Lieberman's heart grew three sizes out of joy. Okay, maybe not, but it's still fun.